Tonight, we pick it up where we left off in Colossians chapter 1. Last week when we were together, we made it all the way through verse 20 of chapter 1. But it's worth just to do a little bit of review and understand the whole context of the letter. Now, Paul had never met the Christians in Colossae. Uh, he did not plant the church there, and he never paid a visit to them. Nevertheless, he had a great love and a concern for them, especially for their spiritual condition, because though this was a strong, healthy church, at least in some regard, as we're going to see tonight, they were threatened. And the main way that they were threatened was by false doctrine that was coming in. The precise nature of the false doctrine that was threatening the Colossians is a little bit hard for us to understand. But Paul made it very clear in the portion of Scripture that we studied last week that the main point was not so much to understand the nature of the heresy that was coming against the Colossians, but to understand Jesus Christ himself. And in chapter 1 we saw, beginning at verse 9, Paul began to pray one of his great prayers for the Colossians. And that prayer for the Colossians uh, developed into something that's sort of characteristic for Paul. One thought began to pile upon another thought, and he began telling about the greatness of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, all that Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, I'm going to start reading at a passage that we looked at last week, but just to give you sort of the, the reminder of where we were, starting at verse 15, Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Well, here, Paul, in, in you know, a, a style that's both poetic and, and almost musical, he reinforces to us the, the strength of this great idea of the surpassing greatness and glory of Jesus Christ. This is what the Colossians needed to hear, and of course it's what we need to hear as well. You know, whatever doctrinal difficulty, and might I even say I'll extend it even to whatever personal difficulty you or I might face in our life, all of us could benefit from just a simple, direct focus upon Jesus Christ. Who he is, and I'll reintroduce the phrase that I used last week with you, who he is in his person and his work who Jesus is and what he has done. And this is exactly what Paul spoke about in that great section of verses, verses 15 through 20 that I just read to you. Well, now starting at verse 21, Paul will begin to explain how the greatness of Jesus's work touches the life of the Colossians. In other words, you can think of many heroic or famous men and women throughout history who have accomplished great things, but their work may have absolutely no impact upon you. I'm very happy to know that mountain climbers climb to the top of Mount Everest. But you have to admit, it's a pretty personal achievement, right? Their accomplishment does nothing for me other than you might call the soaring of the human spirit or something like that. Whereas you could say, if an engineer builds a great bridge and I can walk across it, that's something, his achievement, his heroism, his, his work on my behalf does something directly for me. So what does the great work of Jesus Christ do on our behalf? Look at how Paul puts it here, beginning at verse 21. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, let's take this apart piece by piece and understand what it is that the person and work of Jesus Christ does for us. First of all, it meets us where we were at. You who were once 
alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. It's very interesting, the word alienated. The ancient Greek word that we translate with the word alienated is literally translated transferred to another owner. In other words, there was a transfer of ownership from God and to Satan and self. And that affected us in both our mind and our behavior. Look how he puts it there in verse 21. You were once alienated and enemies in your mind. In our behavior, we were enemies. In our mind, we were separate from God. In your mind, by wicked works, we were transferred from our ownership. Now, what's interesting about this is Paul could be speaking very well of the human race as a whole. Because we were transferred to this dominion of Satan and self even before we were born because of our inheritance from Adam. Belonging to the race of Adam, we are born alienated from God. But then here's the thing on top of that. As individuals, we choose to accept and embrace that alienation with our own wicked works. And so we once were alienated. And I have to say, I love how Paul puts that right there in verse 21. Who once were alienated. He puts it in the past tense, right? Because he's writing to believers. He's writing to people who have received the person and work of Jesus Christ into their own life. And God's answer to the problem of alienation is reconciliation initiated by his work on the cross. Look at those great words there in this passage. Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. You see, in the work of reconciliation, God didn't meet us halfway, right? He didn't stand back and he say, okay, I'll meet you halfway and then you meet me halfway. No, 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 no. God meets us all the way and then he invites us to accept it. That's exactly what we're challenged to do. You know, when we think of this, we can use two different ways of understanding our need as human beings and God's provision of salvation. We can see God as the judge and we're guilty before him. Therefore, what do we need from God? We need forgiveness, and we need justification, because God is a judge. But God isn't only a judge. He's also a friend, and we've damaged our relationship with him. Therefore, we need reconciliation with him. And which one of these are true? Well, they're both true, aren't they? It's both accurate, and both should be understood and appreciated in the Christian life. Now, I want you to notice something else here in these verses. In verse 21, excuse me, in verse 22, where he says, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh. That's a redundant phrase, isn't it? In the body of it. Well, what other kind of body do you have, right? What other kind of flesh do you have? He's using a repetitive phrase there because Paul wants to remind us that this is something that happened to a real man on a real cross. And that will become very important as we study on and determine more of the sort of heresy that was threatening the Colossians. But look at what the goal is. Jesus Christ has done this great work for us by what he did on the cross, but to what end? Look at it here in verse 22. To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. This is the result of God's work of reconciliation. You see, taken together, these words show that in Jesus, we're pure, and we can't even be justly accused of impurity. That's our standing in Jesus Christ. Look at those words and appreciate them. Holy, blameless, and without reproach in his sight. Or excuse me, above reproach, I should say. You see, the idea there when he says holy and blameless... Paul may very well be using the same kind of terminology that the priests of the Old Testament used when they would inspect an animal sacrifice. They would look over the animal sacrifice, right? And they would look for flaws. They would look for problems with the animal, maybe a birth defect, maybe a birthmark, maybe some problem with the animal. And as they would carefully inspect the animal, if it was fit for sacrifice, they would say, this animal is holy and blameless. And in the same way, Paul says, now you've been approved to be given to God as a living sacrifice. I want you to notice how he connects the thought here, though. Continuing on in verse 23, he says, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You see, those 
truly reconciled to God are also those who truly continue in the faith. You see, Paul's main focus here is continuing in the truth of the gospel. I want you to notice that. Now, it is very important for us as believers to continue in the right kind of walk before God, right? You, you, you can talk about continuing in the Christian life in two ways. There's continuing in a godly life, right? And then there's continuing in correct doctrine. Both of them are important, but I think Paul is stressing the idea of continuing in correct doctrine because if you look at what he says here in verse 23, he says, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, right? And then he goes on, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Paul's special concern is that they continue in the same doctrine because you understand the threat that has come against the Colossian Christians, right? The church was founded. The church was thriving. The church was growing strong. And then somehow or another, creeping into the church came this danger of false doctrine. And Paul's great concern is that they continue in the true doctrine and reject the false doctrine. And so Paul goes on now speaking about what he has done for the Colossian Christians. You you see, it brought up the idea for him in verse 23, where he's talking about the gospel that he preached. But now in verse 24, he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affliction of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. And we better pause here and understand what Paul's saying. Paul said, that he rejoiced in his suffering for the Colossians. What what was Paul suffering for the Colossians? Well, where did Paul write this from? He wrote this from a Roman jail. He was able to see that his sufferings worked something good for others, so he could say that his sufferings were for the Colossian Christians. And you think about this, what a healthy outlook Paul had on his own sufferings, right? I mean, he could look at his own difficulties, his own um, problems being in a Roman jail. I mean, Paul didn't like it. He would have much preferred to be free and to be able to be have the absolute freedom for his missionary endeavors and his church planting efforts. But Paul didn't have that. But nevertheless, he could see that God was doing something good and was able to do something for other Christians, even in the midst of his sufferings. But then Paul, in the next phrase of verse 24, uses something that might sound even strange to our ears, where he says, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Now, you look at this and you say, what is Paul talking about? Does does Paul somehow mean that the work of Jesus on the cross was not complete? And that it's his job, or perhaps our job as ministers of the gospel, to to fill up what Jesus did not complete on the cross? No, I need to tell you, that is not what Paul is saying. And we can understand it just by understanding a little bit of the ancient Greek words that Paul used there. The word that he says for afflictions of Christ, that ancient Greek word translated afflictions is never used in the New Testament of Jesus' sufferings on the cross. Never. Most commentators see this as a reference to the afflictions that Jesus endured in his earthly ministry, not what he did on the cross. So, in other words, Paul has in his mind the way that Jesus endured hardship for the sake of his disciples and for his people. And Paul said, just like Jesus did that for his disciples, I'm doing that for those who are also disciples of the Lord. But the word that he uses there is never in the New Testament used to describe the sufferings of Jesus Christ. The afflictions that that Paul spoke about, the afflictions that Jesus suffered as a, a, a man doing ministry on this earth, those afflictions were not yet complete. And in this sense, Jesus still suffers, so to speak, as he ministers through his people. Uh, uh, let me explain it to you this way. Paul was so in touch with his connection with the body of Christ that Paul genuinely thought, if I'm in a Roman prison, then it's like Jesus Christ is chained with me. And if I'm suffering, then it's like Jesus is suffering. And God is working great triumph through my suffering and Jesus' suffering. You see, Paul attaches no atoning value to his sufferings for the church, not at all. But it's a ministry value, if we could say that. Therefore, he continues on in verse 24, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. I want you to notice something. Paul suffered 
but he did not suffer for himself in the way that an ascetic might. You know, think of a monk punishing himself, right? There he is in a cold, um, you know, uh, room there with a stone floor and no fire in the room, and he only has a thin blanket, and he sleeps on a very rough, you know, mattress on the ground, and he wakes up at night, and he kneels on the stone-cold floor until his knees are bloody, and maybe he even afflicts himself other ways with elaborate fastings and punishments and all this stuff. Now, I want to ask yourself, is that monk doing that for himself, or is he doing it for the sake of other people? Honestly, he's doing it for himself, isn't he? His whole quest is, well, I want to achieve something. I want to accomplish something, you know, some sort of spiritual merit badge for all that I'm doing here. Paul was not like that at all. Paul's attitude was, I'm filling up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul suffered for the sake of the body of Christ. Ascetics focus on their holiness, on their spiritual growth, and on their perfection. Paul followed the footsteps of Jesus, and he was an others-centered person. You see, Paul found holiness. Paul found spiritual growth. Paul found maturity when he pursued them for others. I think this is a good reminder for us, right? Sometimes we get so discouraged, you know, oh, why am I not growing more? Why am I not maturing faster in my Christian life? My, my, my Christian life just seems to be stuck. What am I doing? And, and, and we think that the whole secret is to grow more and more inward in our focus, more and more self-introspective in what we're doing. And you know what a lot of times God would say to us in that kind of situation? Look, if you want to grow, why don't you forget about yourself and start discipling somebody who really needs to grow? You know the experience, don't you? You minister to somebody else, and God brings great ministry to you. Well, Paul understood that, and Paul benefited from that. That's why he said, I'm in this Roman jail for your sake. Now, starting at verse 25, Paul is going to continue describing this great gospel that he was made a minister of. Why is he in the Roman prison? Because he was a preacher of the gospel. And now he's going to continue on that thought. Now look at it, starting verse 25. It says, of which... I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. You see, Paul was a minister. That is a servant of the body of Christ. Uh, sometimes when people hear the word minister, they think it's an exalted title. You know, oh, there's the minister. He's come to our meeting, you know, or here comes the minister. Well, I like the way that Paul used the word and what its meaning was in the ancient Greek language in which the apostle Paul wrote. It just meant a server. It meant a waiter. Somebody would bring the food to the table. That was a minister. I, I, and so I really aspire to be a minister. Great. Why don't you go put some food on the table? That's great ministry, isn't it? Now, uh, Paul, notice here, he didn't take this position from his own initiative, but he said, I became a minister according to this from the stewardship from God. God put Paul into that position. He didn't put himself there. And then he says, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations. Now, again, we have to remind ourselves what the biblical sense of a mystery is. When we use that English word mystery, most people think of something that can't be figured out, right? Well, uh, uh, who broke the glass? I don't know. It's a mystery. Well, okay, we don't know who broke the glass. And then when you find out who broke the glass, it's not a mystery anymore, right? That's the way most people use the English word mystery. I want you to know, the ancient Greek word that's translated mystery doesn't have that idea at all. Well, I shouldn't say at all. It's, a, it's an important shift in the idea. The ancient Greek word that's translated mystery is something that you don't know, or should I say you could not know unless it was revealed to you, okay? Okay. It's something you could never know just by your own natural intelligence or by your own observation. Somebody would have to tell you it. So back to our illustration, who broke the glass? I don't know. It's a mystery. Well, I'll never know who broke the glass. 
And then somebody comes along and tells me, oh, Billy broke the grass, glass. Oh, okay, now I know who broke the glass, but I would have never known it unless you revealed it to me. Now, this is what's interesting about the Greek word. It's still a mystery. Because even though I know who broke the glass, I would have never known it unless it was revealed to me. So when Paul talks about a mystery here, it could be something that everybody knows, but they would not have known it unless it was revealed to them from God. So notice here, he says, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. Okay, so now we're kind of excited, right? At the end of verse 26, Paul has described for us a a great uh, mystery that he's going to describe to us. Now, I I need to to point something out here. Paul tells us that there is a mystery that was not revealed in prior times. This reminds us that there are aspects to God's plan which were not clearly revealed in the Old Testament. In other words, what Paul is going to explain to us right now is something that is not revealed clearly in the Old Testament. There may be hints of it, but Paul tells us very plainly right there in verse 26 that the mystery which was hidden from ages and from generations but is now revealed to the saints. And so right now we're just kind of on the edge of our seat. What is it, Paul? What is this great mystery? Well, look at it here in verse 27. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what's the mystery? Well, the the mystery is that Jesus Christ would actually indwell believers in this unique and powerful way. Now, that is something that the Old Testament did not reveal, or at least did not reveal in great clarity. This means that Jesus Christ is revealed to us and is revealed in us as part of the new covenant in a way that was unknown to Old Testament believers. This is the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Now, what makes it even more of a mystery is that it's among the Gentiles. You know, if you were to talk to a Jewish person in the first century and say, you know, the Old Testament teaches me that God has a new covenant, and by this new covenant, he's going to do a great work within his people and and, uh, indwell them in a way that no one ever could could imagine before. The Jew said, well, I can believe that. But then if you would say, and what's more, God is going to bring Gentiles into that covenant, and they don't even have to become Jews to enjoy the covenant. That Jewish person would say, you're crazy. I don't read anything about that in my Old Testament. What are you talking about? And Paul wants us to know this is the greatness of the mystery. The greatness of the mystery is that God brought together Jew and Gentile and joined them into one new body, the church, and he indwells the individuals of that new body, each Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is revealed now in a way that was not known before. God made known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And by the way, we can say that that is the hope of glory, Christ in you. It's not the hope of anything else. It's not your own hard work or devotion or anything else. It's the abiding presence of Jesus. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Now, with that kind of great message to preach, that Paul could go to Jew and Gentile and say, God is doing a new work. God is calling together a new people. He's bringing Jew and Gentile together in one new body, the church, and he's going to indwell each one of us and forgive our sins and do this great work. Again, he's continuing this theme of the greatness of Jesus' work on our behalf. He's explaining this all to the Colossians. Paul now says, I have a burden to get this message out. Look at how he puts it there in verses 28 and 29. He says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. You see, this was the focus of Paul's preaching. He said, Him we preach. 
I love that about Paul. The focus of Paul's preaching was not himself. The focus of Paul's preaching was Jesus Christ. He didn't preach about himself. He didn't preach about his opinion. He he didn't give lots and lots of entertaining stories. The focus was always upon Jesus. Now, please, nobody should think for a moment that Paul never talked about himself. Of course he did. We noticed this in his ministry. Have you ever taken a look at the sermons of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts? Many times he's sharing his own testimony with people. Many times he's saying, look, I want to remind you of how God worked in my life. But the whole point of sharing those stories was not to exalt Paul. It wasn't to lift him up. It was to lift up Jesus and the greatness of his work. And Paul says, I'm going to preach Jesus. And as I preach Jesus, I'm going to warn every man and I'm going to teach every man in all wisdom. You see, Paul wanted the whole gospel for the whole world. He he wouldn't hold back in either area. It was for every man, and he presented it in all wisdom. Paul was a man who wanted to bring the gospel and bring the word of God to work in people's life, to, to bring understanding, to change their hearts, to influence them, not only intellectually, but also in their will and in their personality. He wanted to see them transformed to this end result, that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. That was the goal of Paul's ministry. Now notice this, that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. Nobody should think that Paul's preaching a doctrine of perfectionism here. What he's speaking about is is Christian maturity. This is what Paul wanted. He said, my passion is to bring people to maturity in Jesus Christ. Paul was not like one of those evangelists who cared nothing for discipleship or Christian development. All he wanted to do was put notches on his Bible and see people saved. Paul said, no, no, no. Getting them saved is important, and I'm very much interested in that. But my real passion goes beyond that. It goes beyond that to bring them into real maturity. I find it interesting that God has different callings, different purposes in the body of Christ. Haven't you noticed this? I mean, some people are like the baby deliverers in the body of Christ, and they're bringing new babies into the kingdom. They're evangelists, right? Then there's other people who are more like pediatricians in the body of Christ, and they're helping Christians grow up strong into strength and into maturity as Christian adults, so to speak. And that was Paul's uh, purpose there. That was his heart, to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You could say that this was the goal of the whole letter that Paul wrote. Matter of fact, it was the goal of all of his apostolic work to to admonish and to teach every man towards this realization of maturity in Jesus Christ because in that, the whole church becomes mature. Don't you hear the echo of this, of Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul talks about the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry, where Paul's passion was to see Christian lives matured and grown up strong. Now you have to say, This is a great weakness of a lot of Christian work today. It doesn't really focus on discipleship and bringing people to the word of God so that they can grow mature and deep in their Christian life. It just points to the great importance of expository teaching, of diligent discipleship, of doing these things in the Christian life. I think it's also significant here that Paul says that he does it to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You see, it seemed that the false teachers at Colossae sort of had this elitist mindset where they didn't care about reaching every man. What they were looking for was the elite few. And Paul says, forget about the elite few. I want to reach everybody. This is how big I want my net to be cast so that it hits everybody. I like how Paul puts it there at the very end of verse 29, where he says, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Paul's work was empowered by God's mighty strength. But God's strength in Paul didn't mean that Paul did nothing. Isn't this the great trap we fall into oftentimes in working for the Lord? Our attitude is either, okay, Lord, what is it? Either you do everything and I'll do nothing, or God, I'll do everything and you do nothing. And God says, no, no, that's not how I want it to work at all. I'm going to put the strength, I'm going to put the work in you, your working, which will work in you mightily, and then I want you to strive according. Strive is a very strong word there. Strive is a word that speaks, it's an athletic word. 
It means to compete to the utmost of your ability. I mean, look at the runner running, straining, striving, working as hard as he can to break the tape that's in front of him. That's the exact kind of word that Paul's using there. He's using an athletic metaphor to show that the, the, the furthest thing from his mind is the man who does his work half-heartedly, sort of vaguely hoping that grace is going to fill in the gaps of the things that I'm too lazy to work at myself. Paul says, no, I know God's working in me, but I'm going to strive towards this goal with everything that I have. And Paul said, it's a worthy thing to do it for, for the sake of the gospel, which is a marvelous attitude for Paul to have. He's explaining his own ministry. And then, okay, here's the work of Jesus, right? And this is how it impacts you, Colossians. And this is how it spreads around the world through people with the heart of Paul's passion to spread the gospel in this way. Now, why did Paul strive so mightily? Well, look at chapter 2, verse 1 here. He says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. You see, this great conflict that Paul had was inside of him. He said, A great conflict that I have for you. I, I like it. The conflict wasn't what with the Colossians. Paul didn't say that I have with you. It wasn't with the Roman soldiers that were guarding Paul. He didn't start fighting them for the sake of the Colossians. No, this was an interior battle, a spiritual battle within the heart and the mind of the Apostle Paul. And he described his spiritual warfare and his heartfelt care for the Colossians as a great conflict. I want you to notice something. In the last verse of chapter 1, he used athletic imagery, right? We saw that with the word striving. Well, when he says great conflict in verse 1 of chapter 2, he's also using a sports metaphor. Again, the idea has to do more with wrestling, of working as hard as you can on the wrestling mat and not giving in to your opponent. So Paul says, I want you to know how, how earnestly I love you and how much I've been battling on your behalf spiritually. I've been like a wrestler in the ring, battling spiritual powers on your behalf. Uh, what a great conflict I've had for you and for those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. By the way, doesn't this remind us something here? Paul never met the Colossians. They were among those who had never seen his face in the flesh. And I have to say, I read this and it convicts me. I don't know if it convicts you, but it convicts me. I, I think it's been very, very seldom in my life that I have entered into a great spiritual conflict for people that I've never met. For, for people that are only known to me from a great distance. Apparently for Paul, it wasn't unusual at all. He only knew the Colossians and the Christians of Laodicea and others in that region. He only knew them from a distance. But yet Paul went into the wrestling ring, so to speak, you know, to labor, to, to wrestle on their behalf in the spiritual sense. Now, what did Paul want to do? Again, you can see this is what Paul wanted to accomplish with his spiritual battle on their behalf. Verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All right, we've got to take a few minutes out and unpack these verses. Because Paul is beginning to hone in. He's, he's like a, a man with a rifle. And he's been shooting, you know, at different side targets here. You know, there's a little target of a bunny rabbit over there, and he hits that. And there's a little target of, you know, something on the side there, a little duck, and he hits that. But right now, Paul's, he's really starting to get closer and closer to the center of the target, to the real thing that was bothering the Colossian church, this Colossian heresy that was threatening them. Although I want you to know, right now, he's still speaking in the positive, right? He's not challenging the Colossian heresy directly, but he's speaking in the positive about the things in which the Colossian heresy had assumed to be negative. Let me explain to you what I mean here. First, that their hearts may be encouraged. You see, Paul wanted this. He was concerned about their enthusiasm. He knew that discouraged, downcast Christians are easy prey for heresies. And so he says, you need to be encouraged. Uh, come on now, you, you, you're doing better. You, you, you can be built up. You, you can be strengthened in your love. And not only that, he says, being knit together in love. He was concerned about their enthusiasm. That's why he wanted them to be encouraged. But he was also concerned about their unity. 
Christians who are not unified are easy targets for heresy. And that's why it's important to keep a unity among Christians. I'm not saying it's the only reason why it's important, but that's certainly one. So he says, you need to be knit together in love. And I want you to notice, why are they knit together? Is it out of coercion? Now, now you, you better be unified. I'm commanding you to be unified. No, that's not it at all. It's knit together, not from force, not from violence, not from condemnation. They're knit together in love. According, or excuse me, he says, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery. Paul wanted this because he was concerned about their understanding. He knew that their unity and their steadfastness was not just a matter of love, but also of growing together in God's truth. Now, I think we need to remember this. When we look for unity in the body of Christ, we're not only concerned with the unity of love. Now, let me say, that is very important, isn't it? You can't have unity without love, not true biblical unity. You can't have true biblical unity without the love that says, listen, um, you've offended me, but I'll let go of it. And I've offended you, please forgive me. Right, I mean, you need that kind of love. You need that kind of care, that knitting together of hearts. That's an essential component of unity. But I think Paul wants us to know that's not the only component of unity. There's another very important part of unity, and that's the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery. You see, growing in the understanding and the knowledge of God's truth brings people together in unity. And again, we notice Paul uses the word mystery again to the knowledge of the mystery of God. Now again, Paul uses this again. What is the mystery of God that that was revealed? Notice here, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, It gets a little technical in the grammar of the ancient Greek New Testament. But what Paul is trying to tell us here is that the mystery is Christ. That's the way it's grammatically constructed. So when he says the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, the way that it is grammatically constructed is it points towards Jesus being the mystery. Now finish the sentence in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, wouldn't you notice something here? This began to speak to one of the root things that made the Colossian Christians easily deceived. Because people were coming to them and saying, well, you're you're a Christian. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian, man. Jesus Christ really changed my life. I'm so thankful for Jesus and what he did on the cross. Oh man, that's great that you're a Christian. Isn't it wonderful? But you know what? Did you know that there's some deeper truths for you to get into? Whoa, deeper truths? What, What do you mean by that? I mean things that are hidden knowledge. That are, that are hidden treasures that you can discover. And let me show you these writings or these mystical understandings or, or, or these practices or, or, or these ways to abase yourself or these methods, whatever it would be. Let me show you the deeper things, the hidden mysteries. And do you understand what Paul has just explained to us in verses two and three? Look at it again. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. If you really believe that, then you can't be led astray by somebody who comes along and says, oh, do I have something deeper for you? What you want? Is it in Jesus? No, no, no. Well, it's in this book. Is it in Jesus? Well, no, it, it, it's in this custom or tradition that I want to know. I'm not interested. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. I, I wonder how much it would affect us if we really began to believe that. If we really began to believe this very important idea. Now, again, it was troubling the Colossian Christians. They were influenced by teachers who told them to seek the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, but not to seek them in Jesus. 
Paul told them, you're only going to find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Jesus. He has them all. Listen, do you want to seek after wisdom and knowledge? Go for it. But where are you going to find it? You're going to find it in Jesus Christ. He's the treasury. Now, I I want you to notice something. Look carefully here at this verse where it says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I want you to understand very plainly, those treasures of wisdom and knowledge are not hidden in Christ in the sense that they're hidden there so that nobody can find them. No, 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 no. It's hidden there like your money's hidden at the bank, right? Your money's hidden at the bank, not so that you can't get to it, but so that it's safe and nobody can take it away from you. Jesus Christ is like the treasury store. He's like the bank of wisdom and knowledge. It's safe there. It can't be stolen. It's a depository that's available to all. Everybody can come to Jesus and get this wisdom and knowledge. If it's in some strange spiritual practice or some uh, method or plan or secret book or spiritual achievement or something like that, then not everybody can get it. But if it's hidden in Jesus Christ, then everyone can join into it. See, everything you want to ask about God, everything you want to know about his purposes, everything that can and must be answered, the force of it all is that it's found in Jesus Christ. He is the mystery of God. And as profound as that is, we understand here is Jesus Christ, the most profound, deep depository of all wisdom, of all knowledge, of all these treasures in the universe. And yet at the same time, the tiniest little child can speak to Jesus with the most beautiful familiarity. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that show how glorious God is? I mean, listen, you can never go deeper than what you can find in Jesus. Never. You can never exhaust him. If we use that illustration of Jesus Christ being like a bank that everybody can come to for the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, that bank is never going to run out of money. Never. But yet even the smallest child can come there and receive at that bank. Even the smallest one. You you don't have to be smart. You don't have to have some great intellectual achievement. Now, if you want intellectual achievement, go for it because it's all there, right? Go after Christ. You can find the depths of it as deep as you can dive. But yet at the same time, the smallest, the simplest, the youngest, they can all find refuge and treasure there at Jesus Christ. By the way, we're reminded of this when we see in verses 2 and 3, when Paul describes the truth of God as riches in verse 2, as treasures in verse 3, doesn't it remind us that it's something worth seeking? I wonder what it would be like if people started treating the Bible like it really was riches and treasures. I mean, this is a good thing for us to do. I'm encouraged by what we have here tonight, right? Here we are. If you think about it, it's very strange, isn't it? Here we are, gathered around tonight. We could be doing many other things with our time, right? As far as I know, nobody's been forced to be here. I don't know, maybe the person sitting next to you made you come. I can't say for certain. But as far as I know, nobody's forced to be here. But here we are, and we're all studying a piece of literature that's almost 2,000 years old. And not only that, I don't know if you're being engaged in listening to it, but I'm sure be engaged in thinking about it and talking in it. You see, it's the riches and treasures. It reminds us that God's truth is precious and it's worthy of sacrificial seeking. Now, Paul, in the midst of this, has a very serious warning for the Colossians, where he says here in verse 4, now I say this, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, right? He's thinking of the ways that that the, that the Colossian heretics would come to the Colossian Christians and say, oh, don't you want to go deeper? Don't you want to know the secret things, the hidden things? You know, the things that will really take you to a new level or to a new experience. Paul didn't want them to be uh, tempted away by the lure of hidden and deep wisdom. Because those things can be very seductive, can't they? You know, all you need to do is mix this idea of hidden wisdom, of hidden knowledge, and mix it with a little bit of spiritual pride, right? If you present it just right, it's very seductive. Oh, you don't know that, do you? Oh, yeah, I guess, well, you know, you're just, you could know if you want. Well, you know, it, it would mean a lot for you to get into this. But, well, 
you know, we are accepting a few new members, but they, they really have to prove themselves. I don't know if you're up to being one. Of, you know, it's generally just really smart people that become part of our group. But what? You know, we do have a few more empty spots, and you know, you just present it in the right way, in the right environment, and you get a few of the right kind of people promoting it, and it can be extremely seductive. Paul's trying to shake up the Colossians and say, listen, I don't want anybody to, to deceive you with persuasive words. No, instead, look at it here, verse 5. For though I am absent in the flesh, I am with you in spirit. But stop right there. You know, this is a remarkable thought that Paul gives to us right here. Paul, through his prayers, the core of the conflict that he mentioned right there in the first verse. Remember, he said, I want you to know how great a conflict I have for you. He's talking about the spiritual battle that he had for the, the Colossians. He had never met these people. Yet he says, I'm absent in the flesh, but I'm with you in the spirit. Because Paul prayed so mightily for the Colossians, he genuinely felt that he was among them in spirit, even though he was absent in the flesh. Isn't that remarkable? I have to say, Paul had an extraordinary sense of being spiritually present with his absent friends. You could say that the most remarkable example of this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 3 and 5, where there's some church discipline that the Corinthians need to be carried out. And Paul says, when you carry out this church discipline, I'm with you in spirit. It's like I'm there. Because of Paul's heartfelt and devoted and passionate prayer, he really felt that he could say, uh, distance doesn't part us. In prayer, by the spirit, I am there with you. Now notice here. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Jesus Christ. Now again, I want you to stop there and consider carefully what Paul says there in verse 5, because what he's letting you know is the present spiritual condition of the Colossians. You see, you and I reading to this far, we might panic over the Colossian church, right? Oh, my heavens, the, the heresies all over the place, and they're all running after strange, you know, doctrines, and, and, and they're, they're being seduced by these people who want to deceive them. Oh, it's a crisis in the Colossian church. But look at verse 5. Paul says, I rejoice in your good order and in the steadfastness of your faith. You see, Paul was concerned with the threat but he did not see a Colossian church that was given over to heresy. What Paul writes to the Colossians is preventative. He wants to prevent them from going over into this heresy. It does not seem that at least in large numbers that they had gone over to the, this heresy. Instead, Paul looks at them and he says, no, you're of good order. You're of steadfastness. By the way, before Paul was using athletic words, do you remember that? These two words, good order and steadfastness, those are military words. Those are words of like soldiers marching together in the same rank, soldiers together on the same line, ready to push back any attack. He says, listen, you guys are like a spiritual army and you're standing strong against the threats. Now keep doing it. That's his thought as though he goes into verse six here. He says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. I got to say, this is a wonderful rule for Christian living. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now again, I have to tell you something about the specific ancient Greek word that is translated for us, receive. Because the way many people would read this, especially in the way that we talk today about receiving Jesus Christ, many people would think, oh, okay, the, the way that I was saved, that's the way that I should continue to walk in the Lord. And let me say that that is not a bad principle to live your Christian life by, is it? You know, I was saved by trusting in Jesus. I was saved by not looking to myself. I was saved by, you know, a simple faith. Okay, those are all good things to do. Good, good. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul uses a specific ancient Greek word here for received, which basically means to receive as a tradition, 
to receive something as a teaching or a tradition. In other words, when Paul says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, he means as you have received the facts about Jesus or the truth about Jesus. He's speaking about the doctrines regarding the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You see, he's saying, as you receive those truths, so walk in them. Go forward in them. Don't feel that, okay, I got my beginning believing certain things about Jesus. Now I need to leave that beginning behind and go over to the higher or the deeper things. Paul says, no way. Don't think about that for a moment. The same Jesus you believed in when you were born again, that's the same Jesus that you need to simply go deeper in him, because as we saw before, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, as we look here at verse 7, I want you to notice how Paul sort of mixes up some metaphors here. He says, so walk in him, at the end of verse 6, right? Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. I, I don't know if Paul's being poetic or sloppy in his writing here, but let me explain to you. He's bringing together three metaphors. First, he says, so walk, okay? So we're walking along. And then he says, be rooted. Oh, okay, well, I thought I was walking. Now I'm supposed to be rooted? Oh, okay, well, now I'm rooted. And then he says, in verse 7, he says, uh, verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Built up and established are building words. And so, piling word picture upon word picture, Paul gives us three ideas for the Christian life. First, it's a walk, right? It's like something that you walk in. It's like the conversation that you walk, and you need to stay on the right path. Secondly, it's like a tree that grows, right? And the tree better sink down deep roots and deep roots into the right kind of soil. But then third, it's like a building that goes up and is built up unto him. And like I say, I don't know if Paul was being a little bit sloppy in his literary style. No doubt, even so, inspired by the Holy Spirit, because each one of these is true. The Christian life is a walk. The Christian life is a growth, and the Christian life is a building process, each one of the three. But the main point of it is very clear here. You see, as you have received Jesus Christ, so continue to walk in him, so continue to grow in him, so continue to be built up in him. Don't ever leave that focus upon Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to look at verse 8, because at verse 8, Paul begins to shift the focus. Now at verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit through the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Before, Paul was dealing with the Colossian heresy in a positive sense, right? He was giving them the truth that they should not depart from. Now, starting at verse 8, he's going to begin to confront the Colossian heresy head on and expose what is wrong about the Colossian heresy. Unfortunately, we've run out of time tonight, and we'll have to save that for next week, starting right there at verse 8. But I just want you to really understand the pictures that we've seen tonight, because one thing that really strikes me is how rich in word pictures the text is that we've just seen. We've seen Paul as an athlete, right, striving for the work of the gospel. We've seen Paul as a wrestler in a great conflict you know, wrestling spiritually on the sake, or for the sake, I should say, of the Colossians. We've seen Paul describe Jesus Christ as like a treasure box. I use the picture of a bank, but you still get the same idea, right? A place where valuable things are kept, and in Jesus are hidden all treasures there so that we can come and receive from them. And then we've seen Paul use this idea of walking, being rooted, and being built up. That the Christian life is a walk on a road, it's a tree in soil, and it's also a building being built up for the glory of God. You know what? Thinking about these pictures makes me think of how much God loves us and takes these very high truths. Because you've got to admit, Paul's dealing with some big thoughts here, with some big ideas, challenging vain philosophies and bringing to us the true philosophy of Jesus Christ. And in the midst of it all, he finds way to make it very simple and bring it right down to us. We should be very appreciative for that. And God does that for us 
so that we can stay in it. You know, staying faithful to Jesus Christ is not primarily a thing of intellectual achievement. Now, God bless those who have intellectual gifts and can pursue intellectual achievement. I think that's an important thing to do for the glory of God. Nevertheless, we're not saved And we don't endure in our Christian life by our intellectual achievement. It's by apprehending, it's by staying faithful to what we first received in Jesus Christ by his person and by his work. That's what Paul and what the Lord wanted for the Colossians. It's what he wants for us as well. So let's pray and make that our final prayer here. Pray that God would keep us faithful to exactly those things. Father, that's our prayer together here tonight. We think of how important it is for us Just as we've received this truth about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, Lord, we want to continue in it. And make us sensitive, Lord, to ways that we might be subtly seduced from staying on that simple message. Most of all, Lord, give us a continued and a deeper focus on Jesus Christ. Lord, it's just so wonderful to sit back and say, Jesus is the answer. It's in him that are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the great treasure house that we have in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your word, which communicates these treasures to us. In Jesus' name, amen.